Hello, everybody. My name is Taylor, and I'm one of the staff members uh, with Jade 7 8 Thank you for clicking on this video. Not sure if you guys are watching in the morning, noontime, at night. Uh, whenever, wherever you are watching it, thank you for clicking on this. We're starting a brand new series today that I am excited about. Um, before we get into that, I just want to talk about the fact that I'm in my car right now. <laughs> Normally we film these sermons at church, but because of the Thanksgiving week and break and a lot of people being off, I was kind of on my own filming this. And instead of filming it at home, I decided to jump in my car. It's kind of a familiar filming spot for maybe you eighth graders. Remember when we had to do TNL on YouTube for the, like the longest time? No. 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 No! I would give a lot of messages in my car, and I just wanted to jump back in my car and give today's message. Thanksgiving, you know, is done. Hopefully you guys enjoyed it. Hopefully you had a lot of good food on your Thanksgiving. But now that Thanksgiving is done, I think we can officially say that it's Christmas season. Now, I know a lot of you guys already started celebrating Christmas season uh, before Thanksgiving. You set up a tree, you started playing Christmas music. I know it's kind of a controversial thing out there. I don't really know my opinion on it yet. Um, but now that Thanksgiving's done, I think we can all agree that it is time to celebrate Christmas. Put up your tree, put up your lights, enjoy the season. In uh, the Robinson family growing up, we had different traditions, Christmas traditions, that none of them were uh, like super out of the ordinary. They're normal, like we would open up a gift on Christmas Eve, my sister and I. Um, our family would go to the Christmas Eve candlelight service at church. Then on Christmas morning, we would open up all of our gifts, and then we would go to see our extended family in Poway, which is about 45 minutes from here. We would uh, eat breakfast, we would open up more gifts, we would eat like a late lunch, early dinner, and then we would come home. And I loved when we came home because then we would watch Christmas movies. And my favorite Christmas movie, I would have to say, is not How the Grinch Stole Christmas. I really enjoy that movie. There's a movie called Jingle All the Way that some of you may have seen that I really like, but it's not that one either. My favorite Christmas movie is Elf. It's Elf. Some of you um, would agree. Some of you might think it's stupid, but I really enjoy Elf. And a lot of Christmas, I would a lot of Christmas days, I would spend watching that. Not since I was a kid, because it came out in whatever year it was, but for the past however many years, that's become a new tradition: watching Elf. I have traditions, our family has traditions, you guys have your own traditions. Don't know what they are. If we're in person, I would ask you to respond and tell me what they are. But one Christmas tradition that is very popular for a lot of people, maybe you celebrate it, is celebrating Advent. Celebrating Advent. Now, this is a Christmas tradition that was not really common for my family growing up. Like I said, some of you celebrated it. Some of you don't even know what I'm talking about. It's actually something that North Coast, that they celebrate the idea of it, but we haven't really formally celebrated in a while like we are this year. You see, Advent is a time where it, the word Advent means coming or it means arrival. And it's celebrating Jesus's first coming here on earth, right? That's Christmas. But it's also celebrating the fact that Jesus is going to come back again someday, which is super exciting. We as Christians believe that Jesus had his first coming. He was born of a virgin, Mary, and he lived his life for about 33 years before he died on the cross for our sins. And then he rose again and he ascended up to heaven. But Christians also believe that someday he's going to return and he's going to restore this earth and he's going to get rid of all the evil and all the corruption. And the Bible's actually going to tell us, that it's going to paint a picture of what Jesus looks like and uh, what he's going to look like when he returns someday. And I want to read that to you guys. So if you have a Bible, you can flip over to Matthew, or not Matt, sorry, not Matthew, I don't know why I said that, Revelation. Revelation is the very last book of the Bible, so it should be pretty easy to find. Flip over to Revelation chapter 19, and we're going to read a few verses there. As you're 
Uh, flipping there, just want to let you know we're starting this new series today called Advent. And actually, the church is starting this series. North Coast Church, a big church, is starting an Advent series. And our hope is that during the series, you guys actually follow along and listen with your parents because there's going to be a lot of good stuff that takes place. So we have our little junior high YouTube service that's normally 15 minutes or less. But during this Advent series, I would encourage you guys and challenge you, listen on with your parents. Not this one. You're, you don't have to show your parents this video, but the North Coast one where Chris Hilkin or Chris Brown or Larry Osborne share. Watch that and then join us at our Sunday night gatherings where we are going to light the Advent candles. Advent's all about celebrating these different words that we're going to talk about in a second. Um, but like I said, Jesus is coming back. And I want to read to you the Bible's definition, description of Jesus' return. It's in Revelation chapter 19, verse, starting verse 11. Verse 11. Here John is writing this revelation that he sees of the future. And he says, I saw heaven standing open, and there before me was a white horse, whose rider is called Faithful and True. With justice he judges and wages war. And then it says this about Jesus. This is all talking about Jesus. It says, his eyes are like blazing fire. And on his head are many crowns. Not one crown, but many crowns. It says, he has a name written on him that no one knows but he himself. So I think it's saying that Jesus has a tattoo. And then it says, he is dressed in a robe that's dipped in blood. And his name is the word of God. The armies of heaven were following him, riding on white horses and dressed in fine linen, white and clean. Coming out of his mouth is a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations. He will rule them with an iron scepter. He treads the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God Almighty. On his robe and on his thigh, he has this name written. King of kings and Lord of lords. Now, I don't know if that's the description that you think of when you think of Jesus. You might think of this like Obi-Wan Kenobi looking guy that just sits in a row petting a sheep. And I'm not saying that there aren't any similarities there. I mean, we really don't know. But what we do know is how scripture describes Jesus. And this, it, this, is, a, this is telling what the future is going to be when Jesus comes back. He's going to be on a white horse. His eyes are going to be like fire. He's going to have these tattoos. He's going to have a robe dipped in blood, a sword coming out of his mouth. What the heck is this talking about? Well, maybe later on this week, you can search some of this and see exactly what it's describing. But what it's getting at is Jesus is coming back. He's coming back to judge those, you know, those that aren't following him and, and judge those that are. And it's also coming back to, he's also coming back to restore this world um, as, as though it was a place without any sin or anything. It's something that we as Christians should look forward to. We should look forward to Jesus coming back. And that's what Advent is about. My hope this Christmas season is that you celebrate Jesus' first coming, but you also get excited about the fact that he is coming back again. You see, during Advent, what we do is there's different words that we celebrate that all have to do with his coming. And the word we are looking at this week is hope, is hope. We are hopeful that Jesus is coming back again. I don't know if you guys have heard of The Bible Project. It's a super cool uh, series on YouTube that just dissects a lot of the different books in the Bible that has been very helpful to my faith. And they have a short four-minute video that describes the word hope that I want you guys to check out right now. So let's say you want to describe the feeling of anticipating a future that's better than the present. You might be giddy or excited or maybe unsure, but most of us know that experience. We call it hope. It's a state of anticipation and it's crucial for healthy human existence. And it's a really important concept in the Bible. In fact, there are many words for hope in the ancient languages of the Bible and they're all fascinating. In the Old Testament, there are two main Hebrew words translated as hope. The first is yachal, which means simply to wait for. Like in the story of Noah and the ark, as the flood waters recede, Noah had to yachal for weeks. 
The other Hebrew word is kava, which also means to wait. It's related to the Hebrew word kav, which means cord. When you pull a kav tight, you produce a state of tension until there's release. That's kava, the feeling of tension and expectation while you wait for something to happen. The prophet Isaiah depicts God as a farmer who plants vines and kavahs for good grapes. Or the prophet Micah talks about farmers who both kava and yachal for morning dew to give moisture to the land. So in biblical Hebrew, hope is about waiting or expectation. But waiting for what? In the period of Israel's prophets, as the nation was sinking into self-destruction, Isaiah said, at this moment, the Lord's hiding his face from Israel, so I will kava for him. The only hope Isaiah had in those dark days was the hope for God himself. You find the same notion of hope all over the book of Psalms, where these words appear over 40 times. In almost every case, what people are waiting for is God. Like in Psalm 130, the poet cries out from a pit of despair, I kava for the Lord, let Israel yachal for the Lord, because he's loyal and will redeem Israel from its sins. Biblical hope is based on a person, which makes it different from optimism. Optimism is about choosing to see, in any situation, how circumstances could work out for the best. But biblical hope is not focused on circumstances. In fact, hopeful people in the Bible often recognize there's no evidence things will get better, but you choose hope anyway. Like the prophet Hosea, he lived in a dark time when Israel was being oppressed by foreign empires, and he chose hope when he said God could turn this valley of trouble into a door of hope, like the day when Israel came up from the land of Egypt. God had surprised his people with redemption back in the days of the Exodus, and he could do so again. So it's God's past faithfulness that motivates hope for the future. You look forward by looking backward, trusting in nothing other than God's character. It's like the poet of Psalm 39 who says, And now, O Lord, what else can I kava for? You are my yachal. In the New Testament, the earliest followers of Jesus cultivated the similar habit of hope. They believed that Jesus' life, death, and resurrection was God's surprising response to our slavery to evil and death. The empty tomb opened up a new door of hope, and they used the Greek word elpis to describe this anticipation. The apostle Peter said that Jesus' resurrection opened up a living hope, that people can be reborn, to become new and different kinds of humans. More than once, the Apostle Paul says the good news about Jesus announces the El Peace of glory. In both cases, this El Peace is based on a person, the risen Jesus, who has overcome death. And this hope wasn't just for humans. The Apostles believed that what happened to Jesus in the resurrection was a foretaste of what God had planned for the whole universe. In Paul's words, it's a hope that creation itself will be liberated from slavery to corruption into freedom when God's children are glorified. So Christian hope is bold, waiting for humanity and the whole universe to be rescued from evil and death. And some would say it's crazy, and maybe it is. But biblical hope isn't optimism based on the odds. It's a choice to wait for God to bring about a future that's as surprising as a crucified man rising from the dead. Christian hope looks back to the risen Jesus in order to look forward. And so we wait. That's what the biblical words for hope are all about. Wasn't that an awesome video? That really helped me understand what the word hope means, and I hope that it helped you as well. So you might be asking, great, cool, awesome video, now what? Well, here's what I want you to know, especially this Christmas season, is when times are tough, better days are ahead. Do you understand that? When times are tough, a lot of you are going through tough times right now. Maybe because of COVID, maybe because of other health things, maybe because school is harder than you thought, or maybe it's easier than you thought and you really don't like that because school used to be fun for you and now you don't really have a social life because of that. And you're going through tough times. You might be going through tough times with your friends or with your family. You may be entering tough times, but what this video just said is that we can have hope and hope lets us know the better days are ahead. Hope tells us this, that the best is yet to come. And that's why when you go through tough times, I'm not saying you have to be happy, but you can still have this thing called joy, something we're gonna talk about later in, on in the series. But we can be hopeful because we know Jesus is gonna come back, that this isn't how the world's gonna end. 
It's not just going to have COVID forever. It's not just going to have tough times forever. But Jesus will be coming back. And we should be excited about that. This Christmas season, let's celebrate that Jesus came for us. And he lived a perfect life and he died on the cross. But let's also celebrate the fact that he is coming back again. That's what Christmas should be about. Celebrating his first coming. But also getting excited for the fact that he is coming back. I want to pray for you, especially those that are going through tough times right now. And I want to challenge you to listen to the North Coast sermon, Big Church sermon with your parents this weekend. Or if they don't watch, maybe you watch it yourself at northcoastchurch.com. And then join us Sunday nights as we're going to light the candle and learn more about Advent in person as well. So Father, I want to pray for those that are going through tough times right now. God, there's a lot of us that this year was way more challenging than more challenging than we thought. There was sickness and there was hurt and there was disappointment and there was frustrations and there was bitterness and there was anger. God, I pray that during this Advent series and season of life that you can get us excited for the fact that you are coming back, that you're gonna restore things. God, I pray that we feel your comfort during the stressful times now, but we rejoice in the fact that there's a second coming. You are going to return. Help us get excited for that. It's in your name we pray. Amen.